Hello, this is Eleni Palas, and this is the Human Centric Leading Vlog. Today we're going to talk about human needs. Now, in most contexts, in most work contexts, everything is centered around processes, efficiency, metrics, tasks, success, really achievements. And so it's not really designed for humans. So when we want to become more effective, we want to humanize the workplace. It doesn't mean that the processes and tasks and achievements are, are not important. They're very important. Yet when we start to design and understand what people need and design teams around human needs, we amplify the environment. We amplify the ability for everyone to work at their best. Why? Basic needs, human needs are internal, invisible motivators. So they actually are what makes us interesting and motivates us to do certain things. And we humans are motivated to do certain things, to survive, number one. So we need oxygen and water and food and shelter and, and physical safety. We also need higher level things like belonging and we need to feel respected. We need variety. We certainly need physical and psychological safety. We need to develop ourselves. We have a need to become bigger versions of ourselves. We have inner needs to contribute to the world. And Maslow, Abraham Maslow was a psychologist in the 70s who designed or devised or discovered really this hierarchy of needs. And because most of us in organizations don't need water and food, we have those, we need higher level needs to be met. Now, because our workplaces are focused on processes and tasks, a lot of the human needs aren't met directly. They may be met indirectly, and this is why people complain. If you learn these basic needs, I'm going to tell you the list again, and you notice, firstly, I'll tell it to you, and then I'll ask you what to notice. Number one, respect. We call significance. Do you matter at work? Do you feel like you matter? Do you think other people feel like they matter at work? Number two is love and belonging. Do you feel included at work? Do you feel like you're cared for? Do other people there feel cared for? Number three is certain or safety. Do you feel physically and psychologically safe at work? Do other people? What about variety? Do you have a lot in your work environment to keep your mind occupied, to amplify your mind, to shift you from surviving to thriving, to be engaged, to be inspired? Do other people have that need? Do they have the variety they need to keep them engaged? Or are they just working, you know, until they retire, which is another way of saying I'm bored. We have to be honest. The other is growth. Do you have growth opportunities to develop yourself as a person, as a leader, as someone in your technical field? And then contribution. Can you make the contributions you want to make at work? Can other people do that? Do other people have the opportunities to develop themselves and lead themselves, others, or lead change? So these basic needs, now that you know that list, you can start to think of how do you get those needs met? What is your strategy for each or variety of strategies? Are you using habits you've used all your life? So a lot of people, as an example, say, I feel respected when people do what I say. It doesn't work anymore in the world, in the business world, certainly, in the organizational world. But a lot of people define that, that need that like, I get respected when people do what I say and when they don't do what they say, they're disrespecting me as a human. So we need to learn how do we fill our needs. Now, because most of us are socialized and educated in a, in a reward and punishment education system, wherever it is, wherever it is in the world, we learn indirectly that our grades and our accolades and our uh, achievements are more important than ourselves. And so we don't always develop the inner world. And that's what we can do now in the 21st century. The opportunity is to become aware of the inner world and then meet our needs in ways that actually amplify our capacity and our impact that's positive in the world. So when we know the basic needs, 
we start to learn about ourselves. And then we learn about what happens at work. Are people respected at work? Is there a culture of listening, interacting, co-creating, co-solving problems? Or is it very maybe hierarchical and one person knows and everyone else does? What kind of environment exists at work? How do you fill basic needs in each interaction? How do you allow for someone to share what they want to share or ask what they want to share, uh, ask what they want to ask or, you know, feel like a human, not just a doer or a thinker. And so that's the distinction, I think, from a lot of workplaces. In most, it's like, what are you thinking and what are you doing? And in human-centric leading, it's what are you thinking, what are you feeling, what are you doing? And because we integrate the whole human, which includes emotions, we then integrate the basic needs, the internal motivators of what we think and what we feel and what we do. So we can transform a lot of problems at work by just asking the question, okay, in every interaction, what do you need to feel at your best and be resourceful in this minute, in this moment, in this situation. That's the easiest way to understand what each person specifically might need. And then those needs or the ways we get those needs met is negotiable. So there's a distinction, the need, which all humans have, and the way those needs are met, the strategies for getting those needs met. That's the same language as a nonviolent communication if you want to study that. It's a very good model and it's included and integrated into human-centric leading because whenever we, we respect the whole human, the whole person, we have to respect what do we think, what do we feel, what do we do because that's the inner architecture of the human experience. If we exclude emotions as we have in the last numerous centuries, we are imbalanced. We don't have our whole selves. We have to acknowledge that emotions are part of being human. And then we learn how to use emotions as data, how to create rules of engagement in a team as to how emotions are expressed. We're going to be frustrated. We're going to be overwhelmed. We're going to be tired. We're going to be disgusted. We're going to be angry or happy. We're going to be a lot of things at work. And how do we process that? That's for another video, by the way, called Emotions as Data. But for this one, it's what's the distinction between a need and a strategy for achieving the need. So let's say you go to someone, they're having a problem, they're stressed out or they're frustrated. And then you ask, okay, what do you need to, you know, feel better or feel good about the situation and resourceful? And they say, I need more budget. Okay. Well, what would you do if you had that budget? I'd be able to do this and this and this. Okay, and then what would you have? Well, I'd feel like I'm doing my job in the best way possible. And then what would you have? And then, well, I'd feel like I'm responsible because I'm bringing my best to work. And you realize that's a need to bring one best to work, to be, uh, to say I matter, I contribute my best. You see how easily things map to needs in this example. And you can start to say, okay, so what we, if we don't have budget, what could we do? How could you and us as a team be responsible agents of the achievements we want to uh, have at work and goals we want to achieve as a team? How do we do that with this and this and this constraint? And there's a much more productive and constructive discussion you can have because you've already in one sense acknowledged the internal needs as if they matter. So whenever we acknowledge what really matters to us humans, we can be more resourceful, meaning thrive. Because survival is an enormous amount of survival, I mean, um, uh, resourcefulness that we need to survive. Thriving is a totally different type. It's like we don't need to worry about, you know, survival so we can rise above it. We don't need to worry about our status and our jobs. We can look and we can say, what can I contribute in this moment? What can I give? How can I deal with this or this constraint? So that's when the finesse comes in, where it's saying, okay, these are the needs. We all need to feel respected and psychologically safe and certain and included. I'll use those three now. 
and we devise and decide how to achieve that on a team. And then these are the needs that we, the strategies we bring in coming into a team. Like we're adults, we bring in our own ex experiences of life and we're like, oh, I need this, this way or else. That doesn't work. That's where the negotiation comes. Okay, if you can't have budget, what, what, what else could we do together? What, how can we get this done? How can we help you really bring your best knowing we have this constraint? And so it becomes a much more sophisticated dialogue and, you know, innovative way of thinking about things. So it's not, I need this or else. That doesn't work in most relationships of more than two people or, or more than one person, right? In any relationship or else doesn't work. There has to be an or else. There has to be many ways for us to get our needs met. So as you notice challenges, in your workplace and you want to be a change agent. You want to infuse positivity, inspiration, problem solving at a human level, which acknowledges our basic needs. Then you're able to amplify your ability to contribute because you know that you can uh, work around needs and say, okay, we all want to be respected what do we do? Like, how do we achieve that knowing we're all different people who are very diverse and come to a specific workplace? Or what do we do when we all do need more budget to achieve our goals and we don't have it? How, what will we do? How do we respond to that constraint and that challenge? And so this is a way to infuse humanity into our workplaces, is to start to cultivate interactions, conversations, problem solving, discussions around what we need to feel and how we can meet our needs so that we are resourced and we're shifting from survival to thriving. And thriving is when you feel good, you feel open, you feel cre you're, you're creative, you're able to access new ideas to solve problems, you're energized, you're engaged. This is a way we feel when we're thriving. And if you don't have that at work, if you're more surviving instead of thriving, you can start to say which of the needs are not being met in functional ways or healthy ways. Which ways can I change the way I achieve my needs or fill my needs? And then you can start to do that for a team. Not that any other, any leader is responsible for other people's needs, but leaders are responsible for cultivating a team culture and the rules of engagement where people feel good and will they feel included and respected and safe and have the opportunities for growth and contribution. So this is a very like um, kind of simplified approach toward infusing of an essential need of our humanity, our basic needs. And we don't have to be uh, people in very senior position power uh, roles. We can in any role bring in some energy of what do we need to feel good? What do we need to feel or be resourceful in this instance? How do we approach thing in a way that helps us feel proud and feel like we've brought our best? And if you can read um, my Human Centric Leading Toolkit, it's on Amazon. And I have an example of a young person in his first job he goes to a contact center and he gets a job there and everyone is, you know, not happy. Nobody talks to each other. It's a culture of silos. There's no culture really. It's like this way, you know, and everybody looks down and just does their best and leaves and there's no culture. And that young person from his first day of his first job was the person who infused a new culture into that team. Um, by considering that people want to feel like they have friends at work, by what they want, which is love and belonging, by they want to bring ideas that make the, the environment better, which is respect and contribution. So even as a young person who had no other experience in, in the organizational world, he was able to change 
a cultural experience, which of course increased the performance by 30%, but that's a byproduct. <laughs> he, that was positive, but he wanted to feel good at work. So even from his state of not having a position power, he was able to change a team culture entirely. So when we start to respect and acknowledge our humanity, what do we need? And you can start to say that, what do I need? It's usually not external things. Like if you had all the money and then all the resources and then everything you think you need, would you be in a state of resourcefulness? Would you have a, a calmness and inspiration? Would you be engaged? And you can look at people in the world, in the news, people who have billions of dollars, people who have, you know, families, people who have resources, people who have success in our societal definition, and they are unhappy because usually the external things are not, are not able to satiate our inner needs in the way that communication and a relationship with self does and a relationship with others does. So that's food for thought. And I encourage you to write that list of human needs and study it. Look in the dictionary. What, is, what are five definitions of each term? How do you fill each need for yourself? Well, how do you want those needs to be filled? What are five ways to filling those needs? Is the way you define those needs trapping you at work? Like, do you feel like it's this or else? And that's a trap, right? Because that's too simple and too inflexible for a world with so much change and uncertainty. So start to look at yourself first. And then when you have an understanding of the way you would like your needs to be met, and you start to do that for yourself, then you start to look at the team and say, oh, I'm noticing that, you know, we're not always open to new ideas because we're too stressed or we feel like we have to work, work, work without regenerating, the, uh, regenerating or sharpening the saw, as Steve Covey used to say, in terms of you know, regenerating, rejuvenating ourselves, but also learning new ways of doing things. So that's how we can infuse that into every conversation or in the climate at work so that we start to humanize it. And so human needs is one of the elements of human-centric leading. Because remember, human-centric leading is the whole person and is the antidote to the challenges we have in the workplace because in the workplace, whether we can see it or notice it or not, it's actually designed around seeing people as replaceable cogs in a wheel. And that, that thought affects how we feel, affects how we behave, and creates a really huge domino effect of the challenges we see at work. Now, when we change that thought and we start to see everyone is more than a thinker and doer, we think, we feel, we do, we bring our whole selves. So we have to respect our whole humanity, which is in the needs, which is in the emotions, which have been excluded in most, uh, until now, in most cases. When we bring them in, we start to feel more buoyant and more flexible because we're in a thrive mode and we're more able to respond deliberately and wisely, ingeniously to the challenges we're faced on a daily basis and to the disrupt, disruption, the market disruptions that we are seeing with technology speeding up, with AI certainly, with our own kind of um, difficulties with different groups disagreeing more than agreeing, with questioning our values of democracy and justice. And so a lot of things are changing. We're in a very interesting historical period and the more we move toward humanity and design conversations and cultures around that, the easier we can get along and actually solve the problems we have in ingenious ways.